Hi, my name is Ben and welcome to Field and Foley episode 8. Today we have an incredible guest with us, Mark Mangini, a legendary sound designer who has left his mark on some of the most iconic films in Hollywood history. With two Oscars under his belt for his work on Dune and Mad Max Fury Road and more nominations to his name, Mark's career spends over four decades of creating amazing sonic realities for motion pictures. His passion for sound design also extends into the world of music. A talented guitarist and songwriter, he has composed pieces for several movies. In addition to his work in film, Mark is a frequent lecturer and a strong proponent for sound as an art form. He firmly believes that all organized sound is music and that his work is just as creative, manipulative and meticulously designed as that of Beethoven or the Beatles. So Mark, <laughs> um, welcome and thanks for taking the time. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. That's, it's hard to live up to that beautiful introduction. <laughs> You've made me sound uh, important and intelligent. Thank you. Yeah, as I said, we, we're going to add that in post. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I was, really, I was really, really happy that you agreed to come on the podcast and, and share your knowledge with me because after I've seen um, Dune, I was instantly like in love with the sound design. Um, I had the pleasure... Uh, fortunately, to get in a, a cinema with Dolby Atmos and in the original um, English uh, sound mix, which is ah. not that common in Germany, unfortunately. Oh, I, I'm curious. Are films usually dubbed in Germany? Yes. yes. So wow. Germany has a has a long history of dubbing, and they have a pretty good dubbing. But it's also, yeah, mm -hmm. for me as a sound guy, I want to get like the original mix, and I don't know what they've broken or changed when I have the German version. So, yeah, that's always a bit of a problem. Uh, I'm a big fan. I will always seek out uh, the original native country mix uh, because I want to hear the sync dialogue the way it was recorded, and it, it it's just better. I'm I'm so distracted reading subtitles that I mm. lose track of the story. Yeah, yeah, that's the same for me. I'm I'm trying to get um yeah trying to learn more languages so I can <laughs> um, watch more more movies and um, play more games in the original in the original intended like mix. Mm. Um. Yeah, so the, the first question I really wanted to ask you is uh, not like the common question that always people ask you is how did you get started in the business? Because I hear um, that a lot. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> you hear that a lot. It's like you got, got onboarded and then people thought you were an animator. And that's, that's a nice story. But what I really want yeah. to know and what I ask every one of my guests is why did you record your very first sound and what was it? Oh, my God. You're the first person to ever ask me that. And... um. Hmm. If I go back to my animation experience, we never recorded new sounds. We we mm -hmm. I, I was a you know I was very young. I was 19 years old, and I worked in a a basement editorial department at a cartoon studio, and and it was such a factory, like an assembly line process, that you just went to the library. And I didn't even have an aesthetic that. I should record. All I knew, I, I had been trained by a by a a person who had been at the studio for decades, and this was just the way it's done. You you mm -hmm. were given some image, and and then you go to the library and you find the sounds and you edit them in. And we didn't have even a thought to go out and record new things. So it must have been, as I remember, my first feature film was The Final Countdown. And my partners and I went out into the desert and recorded a Cadillac. We recorded a Cadillac because that car was featured prominently in the film. Mm -hmm. And what else did we record for that? It, it might have been a car. Yeah, it might have been a car. <laughs> That's interesting. And and what prompted you to like start to record your own sounds? Was it like you wanted something specific so you had to do it yourself and you couldn't find it in a library or was it just like the opportunity with a bigger budget? No, it really started as a, a design aesthetic that my partners and I, I, I had two partners, Richard Anderson, very famous sound designer and sound editor who won an Oscar for Raiders of the Lost Ark mm -hmm. and Stephen Hunter Flick 
who also won an Oscar for um, Speed and for Poltergeist. And we we formed a partnership early on in the early 80s, and it was just something that the three of us understood that having the three of us come from um, not well-regarded sound shops, um, we knew that fresh recording was the secret to successful soundtracks. It, 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 it signified that we, we had a custom or bespoke approach to our work, and that's what we wanted to be known for. We didn't want to be just another sound shop that had a good library. We wanted to record as much new material as possible to make the movie sound as fresh and as new as possible. So it was simply a, a choice we made to, to differentiate ourselves from others and to take greater pride in our work. That being said, uh, the three of us, myself included, loved being out in the field. There's something, as a sound designer, even to today, I would say my favorite part of the process is getting out of the studio and being outdoors or indoors, but with some some object some objective and a microphone in my hand, mm-hmm. and that's exciting. The, the, the just the process of meeting people and making the plans for where you're going to go and record and how you're going to secure that object or thing or vehicle or environment to capture, uh, and the complexities of that are just fun. <laughs> yeah, I can absolutely re- relate to that because that's also my my approach and um, it's interesting that you say that uh, in the beginning yeah that it was like a factory and you you got the library sounds because i'm i'm seeing the same with video games it started out um that normally video games would use either just stock sounds or if you had a sound designer it was basically just pull everything as quickly as you can and just maybe combine it and, and make something on the on the computer yeah. but um yeah. what i really want to like really bring into my work is that I always record sound, custom sound for every game and make that mm-hmm. part of my, yeah, of my aesthetic, just like you said. So, um, yeah, yeah, I also saw in your resume that you worked on video games in the beginning, like Unreal 2. I really remember that one from my childhood. So how <laughs> did you come to to work in video game sound? I, I'll tell you in a moment, but I want to respond to something you just said that I think is really fascinating. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's, it, it, it's, understood and accepted in the visual side of our industry that if you were making a new game or even a new movie um, to create the look of something you Mm. must design from scratch you must invent the look of a visual effect but on the sound side um, it's not as it's it that that aesthetic isn't as revered it, mm-hmm. It's acceptable to pull a sound from a library for something you've never seen before. But can you imagine in a movie like a, a Star Wars or a Star Trek or a Dune to pull a stock shot <laughs> and yeah. insert it for a, a shot of the desert or a shot of space? No, you make it because it needs to befit the the custom nature of the project you're on. And that, I think that's an important design aesthetic for all sound designers to adopt as much as possible. So um, to answer your question, I owned a very successful sound company, three sound companies, in fact, in the uh, 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s. And we wanted to reach out. We wanted to offer our services to as many markets as possible, as much as a business decision as it was to expose ourselves to a new, a new way of working. Mm-hmm. And our in-house salesperson reached out to the various game companies and said, hey, uh, we, we've got this team here of Academy Award-winning sound editors and sound designers. We'd like to offer them uh, to you for you know, a future game. Mm-hmm. And that eventually paid off uh, with you know, a few games coming our way. And, and it just came about through a sales effort. Oh, that's interesting. And um, yeah, but then uh, what I also want to know is why um, did you decide to like stay in movies and not go more into video games? Is it like the general, I mean, it's it's a different beast because it's not linear. It's like dynamic sound. You have a lot of 
just mono sounds yeah. that you that need to work in different conditions and different times. Yeah. You, know, you don't have like a timeline, but um, right. yeah, that's that's what what's interesting to me is um, is it like movies was your love and then you stayed with that? Um, do you miss video games at all, or do you see yourself doing something in the future? Um, there's a lot of questions to answer. <laughs> yeah, that <I'm> first <laughs> is my first and still main love is narrative cinema. Mm -hmm. um, that I, I dreamed of working on movies. Now, remember, I'm a lot older than you are, I imagine. I'm 66, and when I started in the industry, video games were about as advanced as, as Pong. Mm -hmm. or and, and then in, early in my career, you know, Mario Brothers. And there wasn't a, a sound aesthetic per se, clearly for music, but the sound effects were usually internal noise generators in the games. And yeah. there wasn't anything to aspire to. But in the early, mid-70s, there, there was just so much to aspire to in terms of sound, including movies like Star Wars and Apocalypse Now, that there was a great deal, there was a great reason to want to be in movies and see what I could prove um, in my endeavors. Mm -hmm. So I, I never had the the desire to be in video games. And then once exposed, that pretty much extinguished any <laughs> desire I might have had for video, video games, mainly because, and this may be indicative of my early experiences, and maybe it's very different now, and I, I'm sure it is. But my experience on in video games was one where a sound designer at the game company would hand me a list and there were 500 individual sounds to be made and they had to be this duration and no longer. And I had mm -hmm. very, very little creative interaction with the, the game team or the developers um, in the way that I have on, on narrative cinema where I'm with the director constantly and we're always talking about the dramatic structure and the narrative structure of the film and how that informs the work that I'm doing. And I didn't have that kind of, of, of emotional input um, from uh, my, those experiences that I had. And so it, 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 it didn't have the, the, the charm or the fun for me that, that narrative cinema has. And, and that has very likely changed. I now have friends who are working at the game, big game companies now and their budgets are extraordinary and they, they're given long gestations and they have a great deal of creative freedom to build, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's just not as fun for me. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, I also think that we are maybe in that regard still a bit in the early phases or right, of um, course. as I have learned, it's what's interesting is going into the indie game uh, industry because then you have um, hopefully if you have people that have passion projects, um, like I'm lucky to have um, people I work with that really appreciate good sound and that um, talk with me and work with me and try to create something together. And just like you said, not just a list of sounds, but uh, yeah. do we have an idea for that or how do we want this to feel and more in that direction that that I think it's it's necessary to create a good soundscape. Um yeah, yeah, I I think that's really important. And and my mates who are in the gaming field, I'm envious of because their budgets are much larger than mine and their <laughs> schedules are much longer than mine. There's a lot that is very attractive and it is clear that that the gaming industry recognizes the importance that sound has in the enjoyment of a game. Uh, so things have changed a lot. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I might, I might enjoy it. I might enjoy it in a very different way now than I, I, I did back then. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to say that it's uh, probably a lot better than to uh, at the times of Unreal Two and all those games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and also speaking of your your many years of experience, um, how do you stay fresh after so many titles under your belt? Because it's a mystery to me. <laughs> Hmm. The way I stay fresh is to look at every project as a challenge and hope that along the way I learn something and I learn a new skill. And 
it's also a commitment to not wanting to repeat myself. Mm. And this ties into this whole library idea of recording fresh sounds and not using library in a way I'd feel stale. I'd feel more like a machine if I were every project just returning to a library and going to use the same gunshots and explosions mm. over and over and over again. Um, there's a great excitement in how I can challenge myself to be fresh every film and find new solutions to challenges I've, I've been confronted with in the past. And, it, you know, like any artist, you, you know, a, a, any self-respecting artist would never paint the same painting twice, nor do I do want to build the sa same soundtrack twice. So it's, it's always the fun is what am I going to do today on this project that I haven't done before? How can I make this, I don't know, uh, this new science fiction weapon different than I have in the past? How can I make mm. creatures different? How can I bring greater levels of verisimilitude to a scene through the use of ambiences and atmospheres? I'm always looking for that new way in that is better than the last time I did it. And that's just, that's, that's just passion and conviction. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds like, <laughs> like you don't like it really have a, have a, a magic trick for staying fresh. You just approach it every no. time new. And that's, I think that's, that's no. beautiful. That's, that gives I, me hope. <laughs> the, the, there's no magic trick. And, and, yeah. and, and it's, it's important to, to keep that in mind because um, one of the things, and I'm happy, I will tell you, And I will tell anyone my magic tricks because I don't think they're, 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 they may be magical because you don't, you never didn't think of, oh, if I use mm -hmm. this plugin and I recorded that sound, I can make this new sound. I don't think what makes me unique and perhaps good at what I do are the magic tricks because I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you all of them. And I say that because it's vital for you to see yourself as unique, not in the tricks that you possess because people will copy them mm -hmm. because I tried that early in my career. I wanted to be like a Ben Burt or a, or an Alan Splett and I imitated their magic tricks. And you know what that got me? I, it got me to be a poor imitation of Ben Burt or Alan Splett instead of honoring what's unique about the way I want to hear the world and how I want to attack my creative challenges. So I know this is kind of an old trope in the arts, but that is you are unique and you should be true to yourself. And the soon, as soon as I began to discover that, that's when I began to get even better at what I do. So it ties into this whole idea of being fresh as long as you are using your own imagination and your own creativity uh, to speak with sound in, in a project, whether it's a game or a movie, if you, if you pursue that, if you do that, it will always be, that's the way to be fresh is just to be yourself. Because to not do that, to go back to the library and use the same sounds over and over again, or use somebody else's sounds, that's repetitive and That's not being fresh, but you know, and look, uh, to be fair, I live, in, as we say in, in English, in the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm one of a very small handful of people in the world who get good budgets and really good time with really supportive directors and teams that, and that encourages and fosters my ability and they indulge me in that. They hire me for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I recognize that I have friends and peers throughout the world in television and broadcast and gaming who don't get those luxuries like I do. And it's easy for me to pontificate about this when some people just wouldn't have the option to, to begin to behave that way. Yeah, I think, I think that is really, really good to hear and, and important to hear, especially for people starting out, which I hope are uh, listening to my podcast because um, hearing that from someone like you who has that many like marks <laughs> and and that that much experience is hopefully reassuring that um, yeah like you said that that's the way to to do it to trust yourself and to to go into yes. it with your personality and with your ideas yes that's the message even if and i can remember early in my career when i didn't have 
the wonderful movies that I do today to work on and the time and money. And for me, sometimes it meant one big success, one little moment where everything else had to be first instinct, knee jerk response. I just got to get this all cut in a week. Mm -hmm. And as long as I could please myself with one little moment where I thought nobody did it, would do it this way. This is my signature on this project. I think that can be satisfying too. And I'm glad you brought this up because I'm, as I, the more I lecture and, and I, I do, a, I, I, I try to lecture as often as possible and I try to teach as often as possible. And I forget that I speak from this, this, this very high place that most people may never get to. And yeah. I don't want to give advice that no one can use. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sure. You want to, to use that for good. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, then maybe also on, on the, point of lecturing and on the point of uh, being in, in that ivory tower, uh, do you still get imposter syndrome from time to time? Every, every There is hasn't been a single project where I haven't felt um, anxiety at the beginning of the project and wondering whether I was the right person for the job and wondering how I will ever complete it. it, it I, because I make every film a project where I'm starting from the beginning. I'm starting from scratch, as we say. I'm starting mm -hmm. with the tabula rasa, the blank slate. Any artist knows the fear and anxiety of day one, looking at the blank page and wondering, what are the first words I'm going to write? What are the first sounds I'm going to des design? And why am I going to design them? And what informs those decisions? All of that has to start anew for me, and all of that is terrifying. So the imposter syndrome for me never goes away. And my wife hears it all the time and she laughs at me. She's <laughs> for 22 years, she's heard me on day one of every film say, oh my God, I, I'm not right for the, I, I don't know. I don't even know where to begin, honey. And she laughs and she says, Mark, you say that on every single <laughs> film and somehow you manage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think that, that that doesn't that anxiety isn't a little bit of that important? Doesn't that help drive artists in some way? Without it, yes. maybe you won't be fresh, or maybe you won't try a little bit harder. Yes, absolutely. That's what I what I just wanted to say. I think that's that's an important driver to have, because yeah, that that anxiety. I know it doesn't feel great, but mm. it's somehow no matter to whom I talk, it doesn't matter what kind of business he's in and how how. How much, yeah, like you said, how much years of experience you have. You always get this, and I think I think it's a mark of you're on the right track. Um, yes. And that's also very important to, agree. to don't lose hope and just, yeah, just, <laughs> just start. Maybe the anxiety should come if you don't have the anxiety. Maybe if you don't feel anxious, you should yeah. feel anxious because then you maybe you're not motivated. <laughs> yeah, you get imposter syndrome that you don't have imposter syndrome. That's Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> okay, so and, and speaking from that point of the clean slate and the new project and you got the imposter syndrome, so how do you approach... I mean, of course, you always try to do something new, but have you some kind of... I wouldn't like to say techniques, but some kind of things that help yourself get to those first words on the page to maybe try something, some, some ideas that that maybe helps someone else for that blank page? Sure. Um, I find that the best way to get started is through a, two or three techniques that I use often that start with reading the script and trying to understand the film from a dramatic perspective. Because ultimately, a director is trying to tell a story and I, as a sound designer, am trying to tell a story, or I'm trying to tell the director's story. And if I don't understand the dramatic beats within a film, I don't know how to begin the process of designing because I don't know why I'm designing. So the, mm. the, the first questions to start to ask are not how am I going to make these sounds, but why? And the why questions are all answered by what's happening in the narrative. If you understand the characters, you understand their motivations, if you understand 
who the protagonist is and what they're trying to achieve and what their end goal is. And if you understand the story arcs and you understand the, the, the story structures, mm-hmm. um, all of that information begins to inform the kinds of sounds you're going to make and how you're going to make those sounds. And what that then creates, I believe, for me, is um, a set of restrictions. And this may sound very odd. We all have this kind of loose, crazy idea that we should be, and we are essentially free to do anything. Mm. But I find um, just as a, a, a writer creates a structure within which they write, so too should a sound designer con- create a structure within the, which they are going to design. And that means creating some parameters. Uh, a, a good analogy is the way that painters will often approach a painting by developing the color palette first. Before brush goes to canvas, mm-hmm. a, a, a painter may choose a palette of colors with which they're going within which they are going to work, and maybe this palette doesn't include red, or this palette doesn't include blue, because mm-hmm. that says something about the feeling, the subtext of the painting. Um, it, in the same way that a writer might might um, sketch out the story structure with all the story beats before they've written any words, they know who the characters are and who they aren't and what the story is about and what the story is not about. And I think we need to ask ourselves those, ourselves those questions first so that we can then create a universe within which we're going to work. So I love this idea of palette building and the st- restrictions that a palette uh, ex- yeah, imposes on the sound design work you're going to create. Um, I'll give you a couple examples on... On um, Dune, uh, we had our early conversations, that's Theo Green and I, Theo was my uh, co-sound designer, our early conversations were about the feel of Dune. We, we didn't talk about, at first, what we were going to make, but it was more about what should Dune feel like, and then we could talk about how sounds fit into that feeling. And Denis gave us this idea that he wanted Dune to feel like we had landed on Arrakis with a documentary film crew and everything that we saw or heard felt like something we could see or hear on that planet. He wanted it to have this, quote, documentary feel. And that right there is a palette creation. That's that's defining the universe within which we were going to work and created restrictions on sounds that we would make or wouldn't make because they would or were not would not feel like something you'd hear in a documentary. And in fact, Theo and I invented this term, this filter through which all sound would be designed and recorded that we called FDR, fake documentary realism. <laughs> Everything okay. had to, because this of course isn't a, do- a documentary, yeah. it's a narrative film science fiction. There's nothing documentary about it, but we wanted it to feel as if it were a documentary. Mm -hmm. And so one of the purest restrictions was every sound should be start life as an acoustic recording, because anything within a documentary would have been captured by that sound person with a boom pole and a shotgun mic, wherever they, they, they went. Yeah. And we, we imposed that restriction on the design, which is to say, you know, every sound designer in the world understands the fun and the joy of going out and capturing a real acoustic sound and then bringing it back into the studio and tearing it up and turning it into something uh, that could be, that doesn't reflect something that exists in the real world. So this was our process for Dune. And the, as we developed that aesthetic, we began to discover some other interesting, interesting truths. So, for example, we assume as an audience, and maybe even as sound designers, that if you're going to be seeing things that you've never seen before, the, the, the incredible images that the VFX team will, will create from whole cloth, 
we should hear sounds that we've never heard before. And, and to that extent, science fiction has been, um, for better or for worse, um, the repository of a great deal of synthetic or synthesized based, synthesizer-based sound creation. Because mm-hmm. synthesizers don't sound real to us. They don't live in an acoustic world, although they can, and we can make them sound that way. But we felt as though too much of science fiction sound, it was a trope to use electronic sounds and synthesizer sounds as a way of defining science fiction because that, to us, put threw us back 20 years in the development of sound for science fiction. So part of our aesthetic was no synthesizers. And in fact, of the 3,000 or so synthesized, uh, excuse me, um, bespoke sounds that we created for the film, only four or five actually started life from a synthesizer. And for those reasons, I think, I hope, Dune sounds very organic and hopefully like the documentary film that Denis wanted it to sound like. Absolutely. I, I can just attest to that because I saw the movie first and then saw like all the behind the scenes stuff, of course, because I was obsessed with it. And I heard exactly that direction of having, yeah, having it sound like a documentary. And I thought that was that nailed it because it felt so immersive to me and so very much grounded in, in many aspects. And even even things that didn't exist, like the ornith- ornithopters um, had this like... You, you saw them on screen and you instantly thought, yeah, that's that's exactly the sound it makes. It, it's like, <laughs> okay, it's like an animal you haven't seen before. Because if you've seen it, right. if you see like a tiger yeah. the first time in a documentary yeah. and you haven't seen it before, it just matches yeah. and you have those, those underlying feeling. And I've also heard you talk in, in some of the lectures about those sound cues that are, th- those hidden sound cues if you record something that's organic right. that you somehow subconsciously pick up. And I think that's, yeah, that's probably why it all works so well. Um, yeah, but also going going to those, uh, this universal truth of um, setting yourself some boundaries, I think I, I heard that now from many different uh, artists and arts. And I think it might be like really an, a universal truth for every artist to have those restrictions because if you have too much yeah. to choose from, you yeah. just, yeah, you, you don't find a way, you don't find your voice. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's that's definitely something everyone should should know about. Um, uh, you know, they they don't have to be as lofty as the kinds of things I've just described. So, for example, I did. I don't know if you know the American cartoon, The Flintstones. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so it very and I worked on The Flintstones at my first job, and it takes place in the Stone Age. Mm-hmm. And when I met Brian Levant, the director, one of the funniest and first things he said to me was, "Mark, this is the Stone Age." No metal. Mm-hmm. So, so right there, there was a there was an aesthetic that we could not use anything that sounded metallic for any sound in the entire film. Yeah. Simple and effective. Yeah, and I, and I imagine that at some point you you really have to find a, a new and different way of doing it because you're used to like doing all sorts of metal sounds. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, something I, I really wanted to ask you because uh, I saw a talk you did and was talking in length about Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah. And you mentioned there um, that uh, Ben Osmo was doing some extraordinary things with how to mic stuff uh, in the desert and on those vehicles. And you essentially told yeah. the audience you can come and ask me about that because I really want to share it. And now, of course, yeah. I really want to hear this. Yeah, yeah. Well, th- that's that. Ben is, is such an extraordinary and gifted uh, um, production sound mixer. And um, I'm, 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 he had a partner who he did this work with. It'll, it'll come to me in the middle of this. And I apologize if, because I've forgotten your name. But um, first and foremost, what needs to be talked about is how progressive George Miller is. All of those vehicles in Mad Max Fury Road were practical, which, is, yeah. which meant they had real engines and real uh, exhaust systems, and they sounded and they sounded incredible, and they sounded as gritty and ballsy as uh, they looked. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ben recognized that these vehicles needed to be recorded. And George, during production, allocated money 
for a three-person sound crew to just record wild sound of all the vehicles for the film and the trucks, oh, nice. the cars, and the motorcycles. Now, think of that cost. George spent on wild sound effects recording what some filmmakers spend to make an entire movie. Yeah. But he recognized the value of fresh sound, not library sound, because, of course, these were vehicles you've never seen before. They should have a sound you've never heard before. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Ben, uh, it was Oliver, wait a minute, I'm going to get this, Oliver Manchin, Machin, M-A-C-H-I-N. He and two other mixers, but while Ben was on location with George capturing sync sound, Oliver and a team of two other field recordists, uh, production sound mixers, were out recording. Every time um, Motorpool could release one of the vehicles from, from filming because it wasn't on camera that day, mm -hmm. they'd take it out into the desert and they'd capture a full workup or series. Everyone has a different term for this, but they captured everything that that vehicle could do because they didn't know what it would eventually do on camera. So they, for a month, captured every one of those vehicles so they would start an idle, start idle mm -hmm. rev, start idle rev, drive away slow, start idle rev, drive away fast, mm -hmm. um, drive in slow, idle, stop, drive in slow, fast, stop, drive in fast, mm -hmm. no idle, stop. Um, on boards and the on board, and these were always multi mic. They there were always eight microphones. Uh, so, for example, for the on boards, meaning the sounds of the vehicle while it was in motion, mm -hmm. um, from its interior perspective, there were microphones in the you know passenger compartment or cab, multiple microphones in the engine compartment multiple microphones on the, the exhaust systems, microphones on the tires, microphones in the beds, and you got this incredible um, potpourri of sounds from any perspective you might want, depending on where the camera would eventually be in a shot. And it was an exquisite and extraordinarily beautiful library to, to pull from to build all the vehicle sounds from for Mad Max Fury Road, an incredible amount of work was was put into this. Yeah, that, that sounds like a dream. You have your own library just for those special special vehicles. That is that is amazing. Probably a lot of yeah, fun to work with. I, you yeah. know, I I want to tell this story because I want filmmakers to hear this bec because arguably sound was a big part of Mad Max Fury Road's success. And if you want a movie to sound great you might think about allocating some budget to capturing these sounds on your production, and these are the kinds of results you can get. Yeah, absolutely. That's also something I always try to advocate, and um, I think this, this quote is, I think, from Steven Spielberg, that uh, sound is 50% of a movie. I think it was it was his. George Lucas. George oh, George Lucas. Lucas. Oh, I'm going to fix that in post, so I don't yeah, look please, down. please, fix that in post. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to leave that in. That's fine. Um, yeah. And it's it's very important to to always propagate that and it's 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 cool for me to when i meet people and i tell them yeah i do sound design for video games and for other stuff that they are interested because they normally you don't meet sound designers and people that go out into the forest with microphones or into the rain right and yeah. that is something that i always try to like really push this idea that um think about your favorite movies or your favorite video games and i think Especially because I come from video games, I, I have this this perspective. Um, as video games get older and you have this like disconnect between the new technology and the old ones, the ones that really hold up the test of time are the ones with, of course, a great story, but also always with good sound. Yeah. If you have a good yeah. sounding video game, it still gets gets you immersed, even if the graphics look like yeah, yeah. from the 1980s or 90s. You um, know, th that's a really important a little, um, let me sidetrack just for a second, mm -hmm. because you said something beautiful earlier about uh, Dune and the Ornithopters, which was, of, oh, of course, that's what they sound like. Um, part of, I think, the success of, of sound design is when it, you don't notice it. It feels yeah. so integrated, so organic to the film that you don't stop for a minute and say to yourself, oh, that was a cool sound. I think that's the sign of, 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 of success in a good soundtrack. Absolutely. I, I agree with you, Dan. That's also 
something I'm I'm trying to experiment with. I'm like subverting expectations and making like sounds that normally would would get this typical. You get this typical explosion sound or this typical like attack sound for three D games, and they're trying to do something new to like um, like stand out with with single things, which I think is is a good good way of of keeping the audience on its toes. Um, for example, I have one game where where I play with. Uh, fidelity and it's it's a really old school 90s looking game so the the sound is all recorded with a really nice old school microphone um also <laughs> and mixed in so it baseline is it sounds a bit old schooly but then you have those moments when there's certain things in the game and you have those really clean high quality recordings that get this contrast in yeah. and it so far it has worked out amazing and what's also interesting is i I even recorded some ambiences um, and filtering it also through this microphone, but still you get the organic source from it. Um, mm -hmm. I recorded something in an uh, old abandoned mine shaft, mm. which was essentially a, a many big caves and dripping water. And the best comment I've ever got was from someone who said, man, that scene that reminds me of me going into caves as a kid, because yeah. it's exactly like it sounds like. And I was very happy that that someone recognized and, and felt this, that is a real recording in it, that I was at that place. Yeah. And it's interesting that you even get that if you yeah, record it very old schooly and, and very like low fidelity. Well, but think about what you're saying about sound recording and fresh sound recording. The reason is that you cast a location that perhaps looked and sounded like what you were seeing on screen. And yeah. that's what we do when we go out and record is we, 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 we are thinking about the project that we're on and performing sound in front of the microphone or casting a location in a way that is much closer to the project than what a library sound might have. And therefore it just feels like it fits better. Yeah. Absolutely, and and connecting with that, you you said something in one of your talks um, where you were talking about the Green Mile that you had the portable Foley stage, uh, oh, which yeah. was essentially um, for everyone ha yeah. that hasn't seen it is uh, recording on set. So you have the Foley mm -hmm. recordings in the actual uh, set that it was shot at, and the set yeah. was like a real uh, prison and not yeah. like fake walls. So um, yeah. that would be interesting to me. Was that like a one-off thing, or do you still do that? Um, yeah, could you tell tell me more about that? Uh, the, it, it, I didn't want it to be a one-off, but it's very difficult to pull off. The reason it worked on the Green Mile is that Frank Darabont, the director, had asked to the set designer and production designer and set decorators to build sets as accurately as possible. Mm -hmm. So instead of wooden or or some other material to make the prison bars out of, those were real steel and the the floors were real concrete, not studio floor. Yeah. So everything that was built on set looked and sounded like uh, the real thing because it was the real thing. Normally sets are made out of thin wood and paper mache and, mm -hmm. and materials that don't give an accurate sound. And so you wouldn't be able to do this. Um, but the reason I ended up on those sets, I didn't know this originally, was that I wanted verisimilitude um, and I knew I wouldn't get it on a Foley stage and so I found a I cast a, an abandoned prison and had planned on recording all the Foley with a remote rig uh, in okay. that prison now that prison was in downtown Los Angeles and had some you know uh, sound pollution problems from mm. traffic and and you know aircraft but I was willing to live with that uh, and shoot a little bit longer while we waited for, for traffic uh, because I was going to get a great acoustic sound. And then when I presented this to the producer, the producer said that, um, Mark, you don't have to do all of that. We have all these sets built to specification. Why don't you just come to the sets? They're still standing. And so we built this, John Resch and his team, uh, John Resch was our lead Foley artist, um, built a, a fiber optics cable system between the sound stages and his Foley stage, his recording room, and developed a, a, a special video interlink and then a, 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 a movable video monitor on a stand. They could move it all around this, the sound stages depending on what set they were on. And then they would do, you know, real... Um, real Foley, what we now call MoFo or mobile Foley. And, you know, if, if, if the character had to walk down the green mile for 30 feet, 
That's exactly what the Foley artist did. And it had all that rich, believable, truthful acoustics that, 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 that we wanted it to have instead of walking in front of a microphone in place and then putting some kind of reverb on it. So it was, it was highly successful. And since then, um, I've been working with Andy Malcolm in Toronto, Canada. He's got a beautiful uh, Foley um, set of studios, and they do something very similar, which is that they do acoustic-based movement Foley. If they need to walk away from the microphone, they walk away from the microphone. Mm -hmm. And if they can't get an, an, a believable enough sound doing it in studio, they will cast locations. So, for example, on Blade Runner 2049, they cast um, a hockey rink for um, Wallace Corporation and they cast a library basement for some other interiors. They, they, they found three or four off-site locations and they built um, remote recording rigs so that they could do the Foley there and have a, a more believable uh, end product because of it. That's, yeah, that's amazing. It's a good idea that but, it's, but yeah. It's, it's, you know, it also, you have to have sign off from everybody on this. So for example, I do this as often as I can because I know I like the sound of that, but there are re-recording mixers who don't like the sound of that or don't like having their hands tied with mm. a baked in reverb and they want a dry signal so that they can add the reverbs that they want to use that, mm. you know, the plugins that are their favorite reverb plugins. And that's fine too. It's that just happens to be my aesthetic. I happen to think that it's, that kind of Foley is better because it's more realistic. It's real acoustic reverb, reverb the ears relates to and, and, and can sign off on. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe also on the topic of, of recording and also mobile recording, um, you already said that you also like to go out and record and that's one of your favorite things. Um, also mm, my favorite yeah. thing to do because it's, yeah. it, it really, it gets you out of the office. It gets you into, into another space, <laughs> yeah. into another headspace also. Yeah. Um, I think it's the best thing about our job, honestly. And, um, yeah, when, when you're out on the field recording stuff, do you have like favorite microphone types or setups? And I'm asking because, mm -hmm. um, lately, for example, um, what I always is in my bag is a contact microphone because it doesn't matter if the noise pollution is there, you can always get something interesting. Yeah. And, yeah. and now yeah. there's the rise of like ultrasonics. Uh, at, le at least yeah. I'm hearing a lot, a lot more about that. Yep. Is there yep. something you have that you say like that's like your favorite kind of setup or, or microphone type? Hmm. Well, I, I've been a Sheps fan my entire life and I, and I remain so. I'm, I have 40 or 50 microphones I have a lot of Sheps, which I love, a few Neumanns, um, a bunch of Sennheisers, and then a, a lot of obscure one-offs like contact mics and hydrophones and things like that. Mm -hmm. But my, I would say my go-to setup is a MS and a DMS rig that I have on a boom pole. And uh, the reason I like that is that I, I'll tell you one thing that I don't do is I don't record in stereo. And the reason I don't record in stereo is that I'm working in narrative cinema and all of narrative cinema is immersive where you, you, you're always going to hear immerse, uh, narrative cinema in a 5.1 or 7.1 or Atmos environment. And I think we, we, we are duty bound to capture as much sound as possible as immersively as possible and as yeah. makes sense. So in that in in that environment, what it when is a stereo microphone useful in that paradigm? I I say almost never, mm -hmm. because if it's a hard effect like a door close or a body fall, you better have a center channel. You better have a microphone looking right at the event yeah. because you're going to put it in the center channel of the mix no questions asked, or, and then you may pan it. If you captured that body fall in stereo, how would you mic it? Would you, if you were at ORTF or XY, would you point it equilaterally at the body fall and then no microphone is actually on axis? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. If you point one of the capsules at the event, then one is opposed 90 degrees off camera and is, is almost useless. So for hard effects, I always record LCR, 
I have uh, through a, a, a bunch of Shep CCM microphones. I love the little compact condenser microphones. And I have a, a C, an LCR array that I can put in a small little windscreen. And I also have an MS rig that I always decode to LCR. Because if it's something like a body fall or let's say a, a punch, you know, mm-hmm. a chin sock, um, I have that center microphone. I can always count on that and that's great. But if let's say the shot is, a, is an extreme close up, if you, now you can spread that out to LCR and it fills the screen mm-hmm. and you get even yeah. more impact with that sound because it's coming out of three channels, front channels, not just the mono channel. What would you do with a stereo recording of a, of a, of a punch in the face or a body fall? You can't put it anywhere. It, the, the body fall happened dead center screen. Would you put it, pan it left, right and expect that like sort of phantom center was good enough no way now in following in that train of thought if it's not a spot effect as we call it or a hard effect maybe it's an environmental sound a bg or an atmosphere once again what good is stereo Mm -hmm. if it's if you go out to the forest and you capture some beautiful birds what are you going to do put it up left right and leave the surrounds empty If you leave the surrounds empty, if you don't leave the surrounds empty, do you cut another recording of it in the surrounds and now you have twice as many birds? Or if it's traffic, you have twice as much traffic. You get this multiplier effect when you start to stack stereo recordings. So I advocate for recording immersively. I have three ambisonic microphones. I have two DMS rigs. I have an MS rig and I have a five channel discrete Sheps rig uh, for a five CCMs. And I always capture my atmospheres immersively because that's how you're going to hear them. Mm-hmm. Now, um, some would argue that those are good, but they're not as good and rightfully as spot mics separated as opposed to coincident. The problem is, is that I don't often get the opportunity to go out into the forest or in traffic and put six microphones, you know, 50 feet apart or whatever the width of a screen is. That's that's a lot of work. That's my favorite thing to do for immersive recordings, but we don't often get that opportunity. Often, as you know, you're handheld, you're run and gun, you got a bag over your shoulder, you got a microphone in your hand, hopefully an immersive one, and you stand there for five minutes and you capture these atmospheres. And those can sound just gorgeous in filling out um, uh, a movie theater. So th- th- that's my, that, there's my sermon about field recording. I have, um, I have lots of specialty mics, EMF mics, hydrophones, contact mics. I have a, I just bought myself finally a, a Sankin C100K so I can mm. do the mm-hmm. ultrasonic stuff. And that's uh, also a new favorite thing to do is to mate that with a good, an, another good, a good shotgun or hypercardioid and then bring those back into my, to, to master them and combining them to get the high, you know, harmonics of the C100K along with the sort of the punch of a good 8040 or, or a CCM 41. Uh, I like to combine those to get a really full range uh, recording. Uh, hold on, I got to look around the room. I have so many microphones, it's ridiculous. Lots of lavaliers, um, drum mics, condensers, dynamics, I have Shures. Uh, I have a lot of microphones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, my my collection is starting to grow as well. It's it's starting to get from collection to obsession. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The one thing I don't have is a PZM, a pressure zone microphone. I don't have one either. But yeah, it's very interesting. Also, like the Sankin is something that's on my list, but um, I I haven't had like the like the reason to buy it yet. So I have I've been shying away from it, but. Um, that's also something that's interesting to me. And the hydrophone, I must say, contact microphone and hydrophones are are so so much fun for me uh, to to use and also to show people because, like I said, when I when I talk to people, when I show them something something, one thing I I easily can impress uh, people with is like binaural recordings to show them how yeah. how interesting sound is. Like a really like a really simple thing, like someone knocking at at a door and people. Are thinking it comes from behind them it's always a shocker yeah and then the other yeah. thing is of course contact microphones like um, how much yeah. surfaces ring 
for like a very long time and you put a contact microphone on mm, them yeah. and people get Something interested like and try to experiment and then they are realizing yeah. it's like in half an hour and they just played with my microphone for half an hour. Yeah. So yeah, those are those are my go-to things. And also a parabolic mic is yeah. is my yeah, one of my favorites because I'm I started to get into bird recordings first, like single mm. shots, because mm. that's what I need for my work for for video games. I need a lot of mono sounds that are really clean that yeah. then can be put in like some kind of convolution reverb and some kind of um, yeah points that yeah. are moving there. So yeah. um, I don't really have a lot of opportunity to do surround recordings, but that's also something mm. I want to get into. I, I actually I forgot to say I do have a I have a binaural setup, but they're 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 a, a, they're a custom uh, setup that was made for me by Bach Labs, mm. and they're these really expensive transducers that go in my ears. And I love binaural recording, and I would love someday to buy that uh, Neumann dummy head, but <laughs> yeah. I just can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also, I mean, you need a reason, because you need something that's always going to be listened at with, with headphones, and it's not really right. not really suitable for a movie, but yeah, maybe for a podcast sometime. <laughs> we'll see. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good reason to do it in binaural. Mm, I should go into that. <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah, so... Also, maybe going over your your vast experience, um, what interests me is also what what has stayed the same about your craft over the last 40 years. I mean, of course, as you said, like how you approach things, that you do something new, but maybe maybe you can think of other things, maybe technically, or maybe is there something that's like really consistent in your in our craft? Mm. I think sound design has stayed consistent maybe in the same ways that writing and acting haven't changed over the years. I mean, writers maybe used pen and quill 300 years ago and then typewriters 100 years ago and word processors, Mm. um, you know, 20 years, 30 years ago, when's the first word processor, maybe 40 years ago. Um, and in the, uh, what I'm saying is that the, the art of writing a story has never changed. So too, the art of designing sound hasn't changed. Our, 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 our fundamental task is to tell story with sound and the, and we're the most successful when sound in some ways works more effectively than words do to tell a piece of a story. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a video game or a, or a, or a, a narrative film mm. when sound gives the audience information and often sound can be more efficient, extraordinarily efficient in ways that words can't be. Um, so in, in that regard, our, our job hasn't fundamentally changed at all in a hundred years of cinema. Hmm. Um, yeah, what else has stayed the same? You know, so much else has changed. Technology yeah. in the way sound is created, in the way sound is delivered at the cinema or in a game. So much has changed, but ma- ma- universally, our job has stayed the same. There, there's someone, that, there will always be the need as long as there is sound in media for someone to tell the story. And that's a sound designer, a a, a chef du son, a, uh, a, you know, there's, there's so many titles for, for what we do. Um, There will always be the need for that. That stayed the same. That's, that's very good for me to hear. So that means my job is secure for a while. <laughs> well, I don't know if we're going to get into AI at all, but yeah. now the, the, the disco- everyone's talking about the ability of AI to generate imagery, text, words, performances, music, and, mm. and even sound effects, I suppose. I haven't Probably, seen yeah. that yet, but I'm, I, I know it does exist. I've seen experiments done at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where they have a um, an object recognition algorithm for visually that it, that will um, see something on screen and then synthesize using artificial intelligence the thing that they think it is. So if it sees an image in in the 
the video imagery of a bus or a dog, it, 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 it compares it to a, a, a bank of other similar images and knows the sounds associated with those images and then mm-hmm. synthesizes those sounds and synchronizes them. So I know that th- that work is already being done. I don't know how convincing those sounds are yet, but mm-hmm. as with anything, eventually I'm sure we'll all be fooled. As you know, there is <laughs> yeah. a lot of work being done on AI voice generation and with enough modeling and even Google even now says, and, and I think also Adobe says they only need something like 10 seconds of a sample to do voice modeling and imitate someone else's voice. Yeah. Yeah, I can attest to that. I, I have a bit of experience with that. I'm trying also to keep up with that because I have an IT background. So um, that's ah. interesting to me. And I also try to understand what's happening. At least for AI voices, what I see is that they are, of course, not convincing. Um, you can do like really convincing fakes, but you can also, for now, still spot them. But it's interesting that it's used as a tool, for example, for video games. When you have a game that has like 20,000 lines of spoken dialogue, you you put it, essentially, you put an AI voice generator there. Um, you put some kind of parameters there that you have male, female voices, what, whatsoever, yeah. some kind yeah. of expressions. And then you yeah. essentially have a blueprint where the artist can work, can like yes. shorten scenes, can do stuff. And then when you have like the thing you want, you get the voice actors and they have like essentially a blueprint and can put their own spin on it and make it really good, um, yes. which is amazing because a lot of times in the, in the past there was this problem. You, you recorded a lot of stuff then the recording was done, something had to change, and then the subtitles didn't match the voice or the animation got cut off or something like that, and it's it's really hard to coordinate such a such massive project. And um, I, I think, personally for me, I see it very optimistic as we will use it as a tool. We'll see how we will use it as a tool, but when I'm seeing what kind of images are generated, for example, mm. there are a lot of really good and interesting images that can be generated, yeah. but you also yeah. need someone to explicitly dream up something to tell the AI what to do. And it right. has to be, and then you have yeah. that single image. But as we, as we yeah. know, a single image is nice, but for like a greater work of art, yeah, you, you, need, you need more, I think. So I'm not worried yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nor am I, uh, but I, I, I comfort myself by remembering that this, all AI is iterative and mm-hmm. um, it, all AI, AI lives within a, a feedback loop, which is to say, if real art is going to be replaced by AI-generated art, eventually the source of all AI is, is already in existence. And as AI begins to feed on its own creations, it becomes to water itself down mm-hmm. and, and becomes really kind of pointless. So I think 10, 20 years from now, it'll be interesting to see what the real value of AI is. It will probably re- yeah. replace anything that's mechanical yeah. and um, maybe leaving a smaller subset of, 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 of work to be done by true inspiration, which is, which is what art is. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that's a, that's a good point to, uh, to end this podcast on because um, it's a hopeful look in the future. So the only thing I really have left is uh, for you, um, if you want to shout out anything, any project you're working on or anything that's dear to your heart, feel free to shout out. Um, yeah, I spent three years on an amazing documentary called 32 Sounds. And 32 Sounds is just what it implies. It's a film about 32 specific sounds, but it's not to be taken as a, a, a film where we want to analyze those specific sounds. It's a film that provokes us to think about how we th- listen and what, why sound is important to us and, and encourages us to be critical about the way we listen because most people aren't. We are an extraordinarily, um, as a species, we're extraordinarily visually literate but we're not very orally, orally literate mm. um, because we don't learn how to listen all through, as I'm sure you know, uh, grade school and high school and college. Um, we learn how to see and we learn how to interpret what we see, but except for the musical arts, perhaps, you know, you go to Juilliard or a famous yeah. music school, we, none of us learn how to listen and how to 
um, be critical about how we listen and the importance of sound in the way it affects our everyday lives. 32 Sounds is, is a beautiful look at sound and our relationship to it. And it, it comes out in late April in cinemas. But what's beautiful about it is that um, we built it originally as a binaural theater experience, which is to say you could see a live show with projected image and a live live music presentation and a live narrative presentation, but the audience wears headphones through all of this. And we did a great deal of, of really wonderful binaural recording and it has all that fun stuff of you feel things above, above you and behind you. And I, I'm just encouraging the listeners to go seek it out, look it up online. Uh, Sam Green, the director, is touring this around the world and hopefully it will be in a cinema near you. And uh, go and see it and hear it. <laughs> I will definitely keep an eye out for that or an ear out. Okay. So, yeah, thanks again for taking the time um, to be here. And, uh, yeah, have a nice day. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. There is no intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> Take me to your leader.